just say hi maybe even um maybe even outside of europe any people hi. from india or asian okay hello gunter where are you from <laughs> from germany germany warm welcome thank you canada, canada. all right beautiful Aotearoa, new zealand new zealand oh thank you for waking up so early for us Okay. Okay. About the timing. <laughs> Wales in the UK. Wales. England. England. Excellent. Holland. 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 Ohio. <laughs> Ohio is in the United States. Ohio, yes. <laughs> I know my American. Hi from Romania. Romania. <laughs> Warm welcome. You. You from France? France? Canada. Canada. Portugal. 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 Germany. Germany, Scotland, Northern Norway, Ecuador, South America, South America, Lonely Lands. Where, yes, in, where in New South York. America? <laughs> no, near uh, Malacatos in the state of Aloha. Oh, okay, beautiful. Warm welcome to you. And Germany again. More Germany. Yeah. Wonderful. Oh, Germany. Oh, in Australia. Australia. Oh, thank you for waking up so early. Oh my goodness. Wales UK. UK. UK, Wales, Wales. Wales. Argentina, South Africa, Argentina, warm France. welcome. New Zealand, New Zealand, wonderful, Canada. lots of people. Canada, Sussex, wonderful. Sussex, okay. <laughs> Vermont, <laughs> Minnesota, the land of 10,000 lakes in the heartland of the USA. Ah, okay, I'm looking for folks who, who, I mean, nothing against the Americans. Uh, but I just wanted okay. to just open it up to people who are not no, from the U.S. Have a chance to turn it down yet? South Africa, Ireland. South Africa, great. No, you can say New Zealand. Oh, oh no, France, France, New Zealand. yay! New Zealand, New Zealand, I'm, lots of them. Great. I'm yeah. from Bolivia. From where? Bolivia. Bolivia, warm Bolivia. welcome. But I am living in Spain now. Okay, all right. <laughs> Spain via Bolivia, or maybe the other way. Uh, <laughs> Ireland, terrific. All right, well, I'm going to ask everybody to mute. Hello from Ireland. Um, I'm going to ask everybody to mute. Uh, Jonathan, you're muted. All this time I was muted? No, no, just now I had to mute. Oh, just now. Me. Okay. <laughs> I thought I was having a discussion, just talking to myself. That is the problem with Zoom. All right. Um, actually, uh, Naharika, why don't you let, uh, we'll have one more minute of, um, of people from, Na oh, Israel. Wonderful. Uh, I'll be right back. I have to attend to something. One minute. Welcome, everybody. Maybe we can just spend a moment typing into the chat. How are you feeling in this moment to arrive here in this conversation with our beloved guests here today? Just checking in with yourself. How am I feeling? Grateful to be here. Yeah, maybe just type in the chat so we can see the flood of feelings here in the room today. Inspired, grateful, happy, hopeful, curious. Happy to see many others. Quite mm. a light, great gratitude, despair at, together. Mm. Feel safe to be with my people. Mm. Thank you, Kuya. Yes. Thank Somebody you. said, grateful to be amongst like-minded people who are concerned for these things. Happy to be with people who speak the truth, which is always true when we gather with Joanna. We build community together, inspiring to see so many other people in community. Grateful for the global connections and similarities. Grateful to be amongst people from all over the world joy and gratitude despite all the despairing needs. Less lonely, yes. A little fearful, yes. Mm. Okay, Wonderful. shall we um, start the recording and uh, Naharika, you'll lead us off. All right.
All right. So welcome everybody to Climate Change as Spiritual Practice, a deeper exploration with our wonderful guests, Jonathan, Joanna Macy, Larry Churchill, and David Schenk. I quickly introduce Jonathan Gustin. He's the founder of Purpose Guides Institute and the lead teacher here. He's been a psychotherapist, purpose guide, and meditation teacher for over 25 years. And he's also a co-author of Purpose Rising with Ken Wilbur, Irwin Laszlo, Bill Plotkin, and others. Perhaps I can spotlight myself. Jonathan guides people to find the place where their deepest gladness and the world's deep hunger meet, in the words of Frederick Buechner. And he's been offering his flagship uh, Purpose Discovery Program here at Purpose Guides Institute for the last 20 years and also training people who are interested in becoming purpose guides themselves as a way to serve the evolutionary call we're in at this time. So if you're interested in this and you'd like to connect further, just keep an eye out on the emails that we'll send out after this event. All right, so handing it over to Jonathan so he can introduce our wonderful guest. Thank you so and much, Naharika. Sorry, just before I do that, just a few housekeeping things, which is that if you have a question, just send it to our host, Catherine, on chat. Uh, Catherine will help you with any urgent questions that you have, technical difficulties, just miss Catherine Haig. You will see her as the host in the participants list. So just send Catherine any questions you have. Uh, yeah, that's all. Jonathan. Can you speak up, please? Can you speak up? Was well, I actually, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be the one who's speaking now, so hopefully it will be uh, loud enough. And uh, the first thing I'm going to do is just invite us into 30 seconds of silence once that phone stops. Okay. So I'm just going to ring the bell uh, and invite us. We're like 559 people, probably be 600 in a few minutes. And that's like a small concert hall. So just feeling that we are not alone. And we are together through the power of Zoom. So just taking 30 seconds to take that in. We're a community for about an hour and 50 minutes. You can close your eyes if you'd like, or leave them open. Just attuning to the deepest motivation you have for joining this inquiry today with Joanna, myself, David, and Larry. And if you want, you can make an intention to not let this be just a, a Zoom call where you uh, sort of watch from a distance, but that you allow yourself to be moved, grown, transformed, stretched, if you're up for it. So I'm going to introduce um, three very wonderful people, David, Larry, and Joanna. David Schenk is the former director of the Ethics Program, Medical University, South Carolina, and was on the faculty of the Center for Biomedical Ethics and so uh, Society at Vanderbilt. Uh, David taught philosophy and religion for 20 years and has published widely in bioethics, philosophy, and religious studies. He was the founding executive director of a free medical clinic, health care advocate for homeless, and a 25-year hospice volunteer. We should probably be able to see them all. So in my screen, I just see me. So if we can have David, Larry, and uh, Joanna up there, and I'm gonna start reading Larry's bio. Larry Churchill was professor of medical ethics at Vanderbilt. He played a major role in developing the medical ethics program at Vanderbilt. And prior to that, at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where he was uh, chair of the Department of Social Medicine. Larry has been cited for excellence in teaching at both Vanderbilt and UNC. 
His work has been featured in popular media such as the New York Times, Bill Moyers Journal, and the documentary Money Driven Medicine. His new book, which is entitled Bioethics Reenvisioned, A Path Towards Health Justice, will be available in the fall. Warm welcome to uh, you, Larry, and uh, David. It's really good to have you here. Glad to be here. Thank you, Jonathan. And uh, though Joanna Macy hardly needs any introduction, I'm still going to introduce her just briefly. Joanna Macy is an internationally renowned activist, speaker, and teacher on Buddhist philosophy, systems theory, and deep ecology. She has authored at least 12 books, she keeps writing, including the 10th anniversary edition of Act of Hope that came out just this month, uh, co written with Chris Johnson. Uh, yay, there it is. Uh, and a memoir, I'll show it to you, it's right here, Widening Circles, um, which we'll be reading from today. I actually feel these books are essential reading. Uh, Widening Circles is required reading for um, trainees in the Purpose Guides uh, training program. Uh, and then uh, with Act of Hope, uh, Joanne and I actually hosted a Act of Hope book club a few years back. And uh, I think maybe we'll bring the recordings back, um, you know, in a few days or weeks. Um, and uh, I'll just tell you this little anecdote. Um, my wife, after our first call, this is the mm. second of two calls. I should have said this at the very beginning. If you are watching this on YouTube land, I would highly suggest that you watch the first meeting, Climate Change a Spiritual Practice, first. Then we tee this up, the maxims and a few other things. This is the second two-hour meeting. We're calling this Climate Change a Spiritual Practice going deeper. If you want to watch this out of order, that's fine too. So at our last meeting, 10 days ago, uh, my wife said, so how did Joanna do? <laughs> I said, she did amazing. I said, um, and this just blurted out of me. I said, you know, I, I wish to be a courageous person and I wish to be a very soft, open hearted person. And for me, Joanna is a living demonstration and an embodiment of extreme courage and extreme love and compassion. And I said, like I always do, when I grow up, I want to be a bit like her. So Joanna, warm welcome. You'll need to unmute yourself. Yeah. You oh, well, yes. I, I, that's why I want to be remembered for being, uh, sticking my neck out, being brave. And here are two men. I just have to say that I am so thrilled with you, Maxim makers, David, Larry. From the moment I set eyes on them, I knew that they would help us, help me and my friends. And I instantly started sharing them with people. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Well, before I ask uh, the, the, the big question, why did you write these maxims? Joanna, is there anything you want to, you introduced me to the maxims uh, some time ago. Um, what about the paper? really moved you? Would you do you want to take you had asked maybe take a couple of minutes just to share what really moves you about them and why you'd like to help bring them to the world? Because I think that they're uh, an answer to a prayer that I've been making and wanting for uh, not just so, for so many of us. Oh, climate catastrophe, climate, big climate, and, and, and we are, we've got to fight it. We don't, but let us enter it. Let us meet it uh, we, we, and to move us out of a mental cramp of, of fear and dread. But rather, uh, this is our planet. This is what we're facing. We're going to face it together. We're going to face it with a uh, free mind. And, uh, and so then... I'd wanted to start making people doing dramas and so forth. And, and then here this came. So thank you, you two guys sitting right there. Yeah. Mm. So I'm grateful. The garbage in terms of the, the hauler. Oh, oh. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, this is an amazing paper. 
Um, and uh, for, if you're watching it on YouTube, uh, click the link below. It's 17 pages, um, and it's just wonderful. At least start it. Give it a chance, and I think you'll find it'll be psychoactive um, in your life. So we have the authors here, and so here's the question. I want to just open it up to you for you know five minutes or more just to give us a little overview. In a nutshell, for those who haven't read it, what is the Maxims article about? Why did you write it and what are you hoping it will accomplish? Well, Larry, it's okay. I'll start. Please. Um, well, first of all, thank you to Joanna for your way of reading this paper. There are many people who read the paper and think, oh yeah, another article, another bioethics article, but you uh, have seen uh, the deeper layer and the spiritual layer and what I want to describe is the spiritual process uh, that I think was involved in the paper. And then Larry can speak to, to some other pieces. But this paper started out to be um, an essay directed to our junior colleagues and to our students. And we started out by saying, we've missed the point for 30 years. We should, we have done medical ethics, not bioethics. We haven't done life ethics for uh, the planet. And we think our challenge to you as our junior colleagues and our students, as you move forward is to take this up. But we started out by acknowledging that we had not done what we really should have done. Then we moved on to say, uh, and this is a section called The World in 2031, which Larry put together in two and a half pages, this remarkable uh, condensing of climate science and information. And it was like saying, okay, we left stuff out. And now here's a picture of this tsunami that's going to move through your life. It's gonna move through your career. This is what we should have been talking to you about. We didn't, but here it is. And then the last part of the paper is, um, we thought we'll try to gather together everything that we had learned that we could remember across our careers. Uh, study of philosophy, work in, hospitals, work in hospice, work with dying people, work with people on the street, ancient philosophy, comparative religion. And the idea was we're going to distill this in such a way that we can give it to you in this form, this condensed form. And the idea was we, this is a gift. This is an offering. And we hope that it will be something that you will be able to carry forward and that you can work with as this uh, climate emergency unfolds. And then when we finished, we looked back at it and we thought, this isn't really just about our students, our junior colleagues. This might uh, be in of interest and available, uh, we would hope, to uh, lots of people. But the underlying movement, I mean, there are arguments and there are intellectual movements through the paper, but the underlying movement was a gift to people whose faces we could see, whose names we knew, people who we loved and cared for and knew we're gonna be facing this. And what can we possibly offer? Because we're not gonna be there when uh, this happens. So what can we offer? So this was an offering. Yeah, that's um, that's great, David. Thank you. I, I, um, this came out of our hearts, probably more than out of our brains. It came out of our experience, um, watching lots of suffering and watching how people with enormous courage uh, deal with that in, in clinical medicine settings. And we wanted something practical. Uh, something that somebody could read it and say, oh, okay, this is a way to start. 
um, and to just echo what Joanna said earlier, um, the catastrophes are coming. It's going to be a very slow developing catastrophe. We need some way to communicate with our children and grandchildren, as well as our own students and younger colleagues. And um, the lesson here is embrace it. Um, Take it in, uh, let it affect you, let it be part of the way you will be and are determined to be in the world as we face these hardships, which are really unprecedented for our species. Beautiful introduction. So we're going to do a little um, kind of Q&A and dialogue and conversation, Joanna and I. So Joanna, anytime you want to weigh in or ask something, just unmute. Um, I think I might just, oh, go, go ahead if you want to start. Well, this will be, uh, I felt a sense of relief when I saw, because there's no question in my mind that this is going to happen. But for me and people I've talked to with, so, with the word of this climate catastrophe, climate, then it goes, oops, fight it. Oh, it's going to be terrible. Oh. But that won't be useful when it's happening. I want something that I can reach for. So I'm seeing it happening and then I reach for. This is happening now and I'm here and I have some guidance about uh, what to think. For example, that first maxim is work hard to grasp the immensity of the change. Okay. I've got, I want to understand this. I want to open my mind. I want it so I've got it. And I, and that means that I'm going to reach for people who can talk with me about it so that I can bring the tools of my understanding. And, and then the, you know, all the others each, instead of being frozen in uh, fear or disgust or it's not up to me or uh, <laughs> is oh okay here's something that I can take hold of radical hope as you call it I called it active hope and with my co-author in this second book but there's so much that we can do to settle ourselves upon what is what we most want to how we most want to be able to respond, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I felt, and you know <laughs> what I did? I think I, I got on Zoom, uh, in my email and, and phone and invited some people to start off with me right away uh, on uh, line. First, a uh, you know, first time we come together, read read it. I send it off. And then uh, let's do the first maxim. Oh, they've by the end of that time over the, we were six people. They said, well, we want to do it again. Let's not move over from the first to the, again. But being able to talk about it, to be able to make it something you can See with other minds right beside yours. So there's no feeling of that, that really sense that we're in this together. That's what was one of the things that I loved about that initial discovery with your work. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Thank you so much, David. Oh, thank you. I, you know, we're honored that you have picked this up in this way. I just want to underline something you've just said about the temptation to deny this, um, what some people have called greenwashing, uh, saying they're doing something important and they're not doing anything. Um, Greta Thunberg, of course, the great activist, is, is really clear about this and calls it out, as does um, a fellow named Bill McKibben, who writes a great deal for The New Yorker. But the chances for minimizing this are going to be always in front of us. And we have to work um, not to do that, not to say, well, everything is kind of always going to be just fine in the long run. It isn't. Uh, we have to respond. And uh, I, 
I read something today which said, um, you know, the people who are the most affluent are going to be the people who are going to latch on to the easiest solutions, uh, which is another form of denial. Um, so we we have to stay after this if it's going to be effective. I have an 18-year-old sitting next to me. You can't see her. Maybe just lean over. No. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, she's busy nodding. <laughs> she's okay. heading off to college in the fall, and uh, she's nodding. Wants to see uh, what is, and she's bright enough to know that she needs to know. One thing we wanted um, was to make these, uh, and we talked about this in a phone call, Joanna, uh, practical, and we wanted them to be, uh, or I should say, they turned out to be something that anybody could do at any moment. They don't take any special training. You know, you don't have to be a climate scientist. You don't have to be a bioethicist. You don't have to be uh all you have to bring is your intention and your attention. And so each one of these can be done uh, at any moment. Uh, appreciate what's around you, uh, train your body and your mind, um, try to help all beings move forward, uh, draw a line in the sand, think about things you will do and not do. This, this can happen right now. Uh, you don't have to wait. There's no additional training that's needed. And it all involves uh, moving in, in your body and in your spirit into, uh, into what's coming. Um, and I, I said a minute ago, we wanted to do this, but actually part of what happened in the writing process was it uh, took over and it became something that was more than an essay for our colleagues, but something that would that would open out and be more practical and more available than we had uh, imagined in the beginning. Uh, you know how these things move through us and take us, uh, when we're working together, take us beyond what we normally might be able to do. It invades all my thinking in a way that makes me feel uh, more complete. I don't have to um, uh, pretend that I don't know how tough it's going to be. I'm going to feel co more confident that I can be with Go. Yeah. I, I want to anticipate a, a question that uh, some people might have. And I'm going to use two quotes from your uh, fine article. It's the question of the intersection of your first maxim, grasping the immensity, and uh, experiencing despair at a, at a bodily level and not getting stuck there. So here, here are the quotes. When, uh, where is it? when one reaches a certain level of despair, new resources of hope emerge in oneself and in the new world in which one finds oneself. So that's quote number one. Number two, we must move from a cognitive observer understanding of our situation to a felt embodiment of our predicament, from intellectual knowledge to bodily acknowledgement. So we've been talking about the maxim. How do we live that? Because despair is so frightening. It's so painful. How do we not bottom out and stay there? And then you talk about moving through. So grasping the immensity, body and despair, if you could share a little on that. Well, one of the elements of the article is we try to say, you have to our colleagues, you have some experience in the hospital, you have some experience with these limit situations, you aren't starting from scratch, uh, you've seen, uh, either been in despair yourself or you have seen people in despair. So learn from that. You, you already know some of this. And then in thinking about this later, I thought virtually everyone has had an experience of despair, uh, crushed by a terrible divorce, uh, a car accident that completely changes your life, uh, the death of a child, 
uh, the death of a spouse in an unexpected way, uh, the destruction of a career that has involved um, decades of work. And almost all of us have been in a situation where we just find ourselves raised down to the ground. And so how do we, how did we go on? How were we able to um, find a way to move on in the world? And so radical, uh, you know, despair and then coming into radical hope is again, something that I think we have um, already some knowledge of. And the question is how to draw that knowledge, uh, that incipient knowledge forward and, you know, work with other people and find, uh, find a way forward. And we do know um, that people in difficult situations find uh, resources in new ways. But Larry, you wanna to speak to this for a minute? I think one way to think about this is that um, there's a hope to be discovered on the other side of optimism. After you've given up being optimistic and thinking things are just gonna work out, uh, and this has been talked about beautifully in many ways. Um, one uh, is, is Joanna's work. Another is the work by a 20th century existentialist Frenchman named Gabriel Marcel in a book called The Mystery of Being. He says, there's a powerful difference between saying, I hope for, in which you've got an object that you're wishing will you know, come true for you, and I hope, which is more a, a personal and holistic stance toward the world. And people have talked about this as radical hope. Jonathan Lear's uh, wonderful book. Uh, Judith Andre has talked about open hope, which I like because it suggests that um, you can have a posture of hope not knowing what's going to happen or if anything can happen that's hopeful, but you're open to it. Uh, you made yourself available to whatever um, can come to you uh, through that. And finally, you know, um, Joanna has said this, Greta Thunberg has said this, um, taking action creates hope. That's, that's the way you can keep your hope alive is get involved, uh, take action and let yourself know that you're doing that. Well, I'd like to add for me and I'm, uh, over 20 years older than you <laughs> two wonderful guys. Uh, as a 93 year old, there's something that <clears throat> I'm feeling so grateful that I'm here. If this was going to happen, and I think it was going to happen because of the way we have been using Earth the way it is how we have been trying to turn our earth and our choices into money so that it's, and they, we haven't been, um, it's been in some way, and that I get to be here at this time that looks like an ending. Certainly it'll be an ending, I, from my mind, to capitalism, but it'll be a, a great suffering. And I wouldn't, I want to be on hand I don't want to kick the bucket first uh, and, be, I, and I'm feeling so grateful that I can be here with my fellow humans, uh, with the, all the beings. It's an expression of my love for the gift of life that, of course, when it's time like this, I don't want to be off somewhere else. I want to be here, contribute what I can, experience what I can, let the love I feel for the gift of life be as useful as I can. You know, it occurs to me that um, we're talking about a paper and these maxims and people haven't really seen them. So with your permission, I'm going to put them up on the screen. I made a, a very hasty slide and then I'm going to um, uh, speak them and then ask David and ahead, speak Larry. Them, them. Yeah, I think it's really important to do that. Okay.
So um, maybe David first, just what does this mean? Work hard to grasp the immensity of the change. Well, I think the, let me go back. What I had in mind uh, at the point of writing this was situations in the hospital where um, people had been given diagnoses that were impossible to comprehend. Uh, parents were told things about children that had been born that they just couldn't begin to understand. And so what we knew was they needed eventually to understand it, but if we went in right away and said, here are these catastrophic things that have happened and you need to do something, then people were going to, to freeze. And so then I tried to extrapolate that out. Um, this this uh, phenomenon, this uh, climate emergency, all the things that are coming really is immense beyond I think beyond any one person's understanding, we, we have to work together to, to grasp it. And it takes hard work and it takes intellectual work, but it takes emotional work. It takes um, grief work. It takes rage work. It takes work of joy in trying to um, appreciate the people who are working with you uh, around it. And so the idea, the primary idea was it takes work. Uh, you don't have to do it by yourself. And don't be discouraged that it is so large. You're going to be working on this for a long time. Uh, you know, every week or every month, there's a new piece. Or you take a break from a while and then you see every year there's a new piece. This is going to be an ongoing uh, process mm. answer mm. question. before i go to the next one i just want to thank you you know you you're gleaning from your work in hospice helping people to comprehend the impossible uh, a terminal cancer diagnosis um, and that you're saying it takes work and it's step by step and you don't have to do it alone um beautiful so um uh larry um cultivate radical hope what does that mean to you? Yeah, I, I think I was talking about just this kind of thing in my last comment. Uh, but let me go back to the immensity of the change just a moment, because, um, you know, the people who have studied this say we are evolutionarily equipped to focus on medium-sized objects in our immediate visual field. So this is very tough. This is a place where uh, an intergenerational, um, slow gestating, but inevitable emergency is something that, you know, it, it's just not part of what we typically do. So this is another reason why we have to work at this. Um, but radical hope, uh, I think is, is one of the most important ones because as we've said, it, it's the hope that you arrive at uh, after you've given up all the typical solutions, people are going to be offering up like technological innovation is going to save us after you've gotten over denial um, and after it really seeks, seeps in, you know, to your being. That's that's what we're talking about here. Uh, and this is going to look a little different for everybody and can be talked about a wide range of ways. Mm. But mm. as you said, Jonathan, Hope is the opposite of despair. That, that's where we have to go. Mm -hmm. Beautifully put. I was I just uh, hand, handed uh, this cover of my book, Active Hope, and the subtitle, I just want to say it, how to face the mess we're in with unexpected resilience and creative power. It doesn't mean how to face it so it'll go away. It doesn't say uh, how to face it so you'll be happy and comfortable forever, but that you will be able to be there <laughs> with all of yourself and with your love for life. I know that's possible. I, I appreciate that word, unexpected. It goes well with the radical 
right? Hope, unexpected and radical hope, a beautiful uh, pairing. And I also appreciate, Larry, you speaking to the, the scope of the, the immensity and scope of the problem is it's not medium and it's not at a medium distance and that we have to work. There's an effort that needs to be put in for something that is decades, centuries, and even millennia um, uh, having effects at that timeline. Yeah. Um, so David, have a line in the sand. Could you just open that up a little for us? Uh, part of the idea, again, going back to the hospital was uh, we have advanced directives and people are asked to uh, prepare advanced directives and they say, please don't do this, please don't do this, don't feed me, do feed me, um, intubate me, don't intubate me. And these are uh, lines in the sand. We're saying, don't go any further than this. Or sometimes in conversation with the medical team, you would say, uh, what's the line in the sand? When are you gonna stop new procedures, new um, treatments and things like that? And in fact, you would push a medical team to have a line in the sand so that you would know what you were not going to do. So my thought then was, um, if you are in challenging and difficult circumstances, uh, it's good to think ahead about what you would be willing to do and not uh, be willing to do. And here, there's mm -hmm. uh, a great deal of science fiction uh, that can be helpful to us, mm -hmm. um, um, books and, and movies, where people are depicted in situations where they have to make horrible choices about, um, you know, who's going to be fed, who's not going to be fed, what kind of triage will be done, uh, what level of violence or nonviolence non are you uh, willing to uh, participate in? And um, Sherry Fink's book about five days at Memorial about this uh, catastrophic situation in the hospital in uh, New Orleans after Katrina and the impossible decisions that doctors had to make when it was clear that certain patients weren't going to be able to be evacuated. Uh, and what do we do at that point? And how do families deal with that? And how to, um, how the physicians themselves did with it. But part of the idea was rehearse this in your mind. You might change your mind later, but just like uh, an emergency medical team practices certain things, do this. Think about what the kinds of situations you might uh, find yourself in. Yeah, it's One kind of like in, in uh, responding to the paper said, well, this is a stupid idea because everything is changing all the time and the sand is changing like the wind is blowing and what are you talking about? And my response to that is, that's part of the point. Draw the line and then be ready to shift as uh, situation shifts. Well, we could spend an hour on just that one, uh, but I'm going to go to the next one. So I want everyone to have an opportunity to, to hear you to speak to these. Appreciate the astonishing opportunity of life at this time, which seems to be at odds with the news from IPIC and, and even beyond IPIC about what's going to happen. Why do you use the word astonishing opportunity? And why ask us to appreciate it? That's that's got some verve to say that. Well, let me revert back to um, number three, just very quickly, if I may. Uh, anybody who's ever done a uh, living will, a durable power of attorney, an advanced uh, statement about what they will and will not accept for medical treatment at the end of life has an experience of drawing a line in the sand. That, that's what we're talking about. But uh, Joanna has really said something powerful and important already about the astonishing opportunity. And that is that uh, no other uh, human beings in our history have uh, witnessed anything like this, anything close to this. Uh, so there's a, a sense of uh, almost being uh, blessed uh, by the fact that we're here at this point in time and uh, hopefully can make a difference. But uh, 
that this is new to our species. Isn't that amazing? I think um, the word appreciate, Jonathan, that you picked out is yeah. is the decisive word. Yeah. Because you you have to be looking. Uh, you have to be looking for it. And if you aren't um, in a stance of gratefulness and receptivity, then you're not going to see these opportunities. They're not, they're not going to appear. But if you begin to try to look around, there are always, I mean, we understand this from uh, literature in uh, people in concentration camps in uh, gulags, people in uh, solitary confinement for decades at a time. Uh, but uh, these, they are able to find something astonishing to work with, reason to live. Uh, and so begin to look for that. And it might be uh, simply that, you know, the grass is breaking through the sidewalk in front of your house, go grass. Or um, this wonderful poplar tree that's 120 years old outside the window of my apartment. How could it have been there 120 years? What does it have to teach me? What have we not learned from uh, the trees all around us? And we can do that at any, at any moment, at, at any moment. I'm, I'm so thankful for you to, to invite us to, uh, to work on appreciation. Because it's sometimes I read the news and I'm like appreciative. I, that's the furthest thing from what I'm feeling. <laughs> but you're asking us to live the maxim, stretch and work into it. And yeah, we can do that to be at a pivotal time, a never seen before experience in our species history. I mean, that's pretty amazing. And yes, it has a lot of you know sadness and pain. I want to go to the next one, though train your body and mind why how to what end so my first thought about this was grief is hard work uh gr grief is mm, often treated as like this emotional thing and you'll like mm, you know you'll get over it uh terrible misreading of kubler ross uh, you'll go through the stages and then everything will be okay. Uh, but grief is hard bodily work. And we know there's going to be enormous grief. So prepare for that. What, what does your body uh, need to be able to do? Um, and then I was also thinking of hmm. mindfulness exercises of yoga, of Tai Chi, of Kijang, of, again, training body and mind to be prepared to, I mean, this goes with number one, uh, working hard to grasp the immensity. Part of being able to grasp the immensity is uh, you need to train your body and your mind. It's, it is physically difficult and it is mentally demanding and mentally consuming. And so to have a discipline, um, a mental and cognitive discipline that helps you bring it into focus or move it out of your mind for a little while. But, you know, mm -hmm. set aside, set the monkey mind aside. Let's stay in a quiet, centered place. You can't do that unless you train. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is part of the idea of, <clears throat> this is an embodied experience. This isn't just, uh, it needs to be your whole being engage because this is a entire world uh crisis mm, mm. before i go to the next one i want to ask you joanna to comment on that because it, to me you're someone who exemplifies someone who has done that training and that training is a demonstration to people of how you can meet whether it's nuclear disarmament or climate change what is one or two ways you have trained that you have found have been efficacious in meeting difficult oh. situations? Oh, well, I find um, I have become, uh, I used to be, find it very easy to complain. I still do. Uh, and, and then just 
And the most recent time I just see complaining is one of the most boring things. <laughs> what, how useless that is. And so when, what I found in replacing complaining was being awed by other people or what in, in um, Mudita, joy in the joy of others, strength in the strength of others. I've learned to be an admirer of people and looking at so many, I'm, I've been doing it, listening to the three of you. I've so much time you open your mouth and I'm awed by what comes out. So, so that I, and, and a Buddhism that's called Mudita, uh, joy in the joy of others, strength in the strength of others. Uh, treat the heroic qualities of the people around you as uh, something that you get a real uh, kick out of and uh, joy in perceiving. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for responding to my question. That was great. I want to get to this last one, um, uh, which is um, uh, uh, future generations. You're acting for not just yourself and what you see before you, but for future generations of all species. Could you just unpack that a little more for us? Well, maybe I'll start. Um, the, the philosopher in Washington State, uh, Stephen Gardner, calls it the tyranny of humanity over all other living things. And I think that captures it beautifully. Um, the other thing I would say is uh, there are concepts that can be very helpful in understanding this. And one of them comes from the uh, world famous entomologist, the guy who studied ants, E.O. Wilson. Mm. He, has, he has a book called Biophilia. And that's the kind of innate need to connect in an affectionate way with other species, all other living things. And I just think that's so important and so neglected. So uh, I would say, you know, get a hold of that concept and let, let, it, let it work its way into your thinking, biophilia. Um, well, Joanna is, is uh, the great teacher of, of this uh, maxim. And the first book that I ran across, um, Thinking Like a Mountain, the Council of All Beings. Uh, such a fabulous idea, just sort of blew my head open. Uh, not only uh, thinking about it as a group exercise, but also thinking about it as an individual exercise. You know, I could move around and stand with this tree, stand with this rock. And so that to me is just one of the beautiful uh, teachings about this. But this also touches in for me in relation to despair. Uh, we might have despair about our present situation, mm -hmm. but we can do one thing, two things, three things that might make it possible for future generations to uh, thrive and to do better. Uh, we may not be able to save X, Y, or Z that we're working on right now, but we can do things that will further uh, all kinds of beings. The other thing that uh, we wanted to address here was questions of justice and questions of uh, catastrophic um, uh, discrepancies in uh, income, in opportunities, in resources, across human nations, across the world. And so when we say uh, attend to uh, all beings, it includes all human beings. And I think the, the idea of justice applies to human beings, all human beings, Northern Hemisphere, Southern Hemisphere, um, but it applies to the trees, it applies to the kelp, it applies to uh, the whales, it applies to the bugs that uh, Wilson uh, studied for such a long time. It's this uh, encompassing net, which um, we are a part of. We, we, are, uh, we are of this net, it's us. 
Well, we're almost to, to the hour. I want to just ask each of you to just offer us something um, by way of sort of concluding this time. My, my piece is to really heartily recommend that people spend time with the paper. It's 17 pages long, a little difficult at times, but just get through those parts. Um, and the invitation, when I was on the phone with these two, they said it's about living the maxims. It's not a paper to just read and behold, but to take a maxim and live with it, let it change you. So my invitation is start with the reading. Amen. Thank you. My, my suggestion would be, um, you know, there's nothing sacred about these six maxims. We think they work. We think they're important. But, but um, there are people who thought about this long and hard, and they have different ways of expressing it and maybe completely different ideas. We want to know what those are. So if you have such ideas, put them out there. Um, this is a work in progress. Yeah, I would say if um, these maxims don't speak to you, right, pitch them out, recycle them. But I would urge you to find some maxims because the idea of having something available that you can turn to when things are difficult and that you know them, that they are part of your body and part of your consciousness. So, you know, Four Noble Truths, you should be able to recall that and it will help you whenever there's a situation of, of suffering. So if these maxims don't speak to you, look around. There are other sets of maxims, find the ones that speak to you, but find something that will uh, help you through the times that are difficult. Um, so do we have like one minute, Jonathan, or like two minutes? Go for it, two uh, minutes. Okay. Um, I was going to say a few more things about your paper, but you, you uh, go for it. Okay. Um, just a suggestion about reading the paper. Uh, it comes in like three pieces, okay? There's the introductory stuff. There's this wonderful section, The World in 2031, that Larry wrote. Uh, and then there's a section on the maxims. The first part is kind of like shop talk, you know, bioethics people talking to each other, using bioethics words. You can kind of, I've already given you the gist of that. We missed the point. We want to give you something else. The shop talk is kind of like you walk in the garage, not through the front door, but into bay in the back. And these guys are all talking about things you don't understand, caterpillars, not caterpillars, but you know, anyhow, I can't even talk about it. But they're talking about other stuff you don't understand. And what you want to know is, what was wrong with my car? What do I do next? So don't worry about the first part. Come back to it later. But read the world in 2031 and then go to the maxims. And then you can come back through. You can look at the discussion of uh, distinction between mitigation and adaptation, things like that. So that's a suggestion. Um, I have this poem that I could read, but maybe I should wait till we're all done, or I could read it right now. Uh, Joanna and Jonathan have both seen this poem, so it's been, you know, it's like vetted. It's definitely vetted. <laughs> um, uh, yes, why don't we have you end with it? I want to recommend this. Um, I was hoping to have uh, some of the participants today interact with you, but the, the time evaporated as it sometimes does. Um, at the bottom of this YouTube video is a link to a Facebook page uh, for Purpose Guides Institute. I'm going to go on there and put out a question. How in any way has this paper moved you? And in particular, I'm going to make this request, pick a maxim and speak to your reaction to it. Maybe draw a line in the sand, maybe grasp the immensity. And I like this idea of work. It's not, it's not just a paper to read that we work with it. So I'll have to actually think, well, how do I feel about drawing a line in the sand? And we can, have, we can come together as a community virtually, you know, in different times um, to be with the paper, to be with the maxims. So this is one way we can, uh, connect with it and each other virtually. Yeah. Joanna, is there anything you want to uh, say before we finish up this part and have David offer his poem? I'm so happy. I'm 
got tears in my voice. I'm just so glad to be part of this conversation. You were really addressing soul questions. And uh, it's such a privilege. You invite soul questions. So we're grateful to even be uh, in conversation with you. It's a privilege. David. So the title of this poem is to be declaimed at Pack Square. And Pack Square, Catherine knows about this, is in Asheville, North Carolina. But all of us have been in towns that have a square, big buildings around it, kind of a park in the middle. So think of it as uh, any square that you know about. To be declaimed at Pack Square. Listen to the whisper of the grass. Feel the dew on your feet and know that all passes. Know that none of these buildings will last and that nothing being done by the grand people in these oh so important buildings will last. Know that your bodies are divine and that every touch is but a miracle. Know that the world is made in your tears and in your hearts. Bless you for living in this dark time. Not all souls were willing to be here. And know this finally, that the circle of love is not broken by death. David, Larry, thank you for your heart-soaked paper and the invitation to work with the Maxims and to face this world with appreciation. I appreciate you too. And of course, I appreciate you, Joanna, very, very much. And I just want to say to David and Larry, I love you. I, I am so... Glad that you are here with us. Uh, we're, so we're, honored. we're honored. Thank you. Yeah. Astonished. It's wonderful. Thank you. Mm. I'm just going to sound the bell once and then 30 seconds later, just as a kind of a space between the, the two sections. I'll explain what the second section is in a moment. If you like, just close your eyes. And again, just knowing you're joining with six, seven hundred or more people, maybe thousands through the YouTube video. And experience this fact, you are not alone. It takes a village to grasp the immensity. It takes a village to have a culture of appreciation. Thank you for teaching that to me, all three of you. Well, I invite you to take a little 20 second stretch with me if you'd like. And I'm just gonna tee up what the second hour is and then you can decide if you're gonna Stay with it. <clears throat> um, so the the second hour I'm calling climate change um, and and soul discovery or purpose discovery, uh, and um, I'll say a few words and then I'll do a little um, presentation. And it will include um, me reading two vignettes from Joanna's book, Widening Circles, two moments when um, she experienced, in her words, a soul disclosure or, or revelation. 
um, because I want to have you have illustrated a real story or stories from from a true elder. Um, but wh what it is like to receive a calling and respond and have that embolden and enliven you in your activist work and in your wild loving of the earth. Um, so I'm going to talk for a bit and then uh, Joanne and I are going to discuss um, this idea of a, of a journey to revelation and, and soul level disclosure. Uh, and then there'll be some time, uh, hopefully, um, to take a few questions from this group that's gathered together. And then I'm going to uh, invite uh, Larry and David um, back at the end to just offer whatever comes to them on this subject. And I told them ahead of time, it's okay if you see it differently or disagree. I really just want a, a, a true conversation rather than you know selling any one particular message. So I'm going to... Um, put up a, uh, a little slide presentation and um, let's see here. So this is a, just a little preamble that literally Naharika and I wrote together <laughs> just before we realized, oh, this that we need a little more of a bridge. And it goes without saying, Joanna, please feel free at any point to come in with a question, a disagreement, a teaching, a story. Um, and if you don't, that's fine too. I'll, I will go for 12 minutes. And, um, in fact, I'll set the timer so that I don't... Uh... What, is, when did the, what is this? So this is a, uh, so these are the two opening slides. So you are not an accident at this time. This is my invitation for you to consider. Uh, yes, extinction is now a possible consequence of failing to step into what could be called an egocentric rather than an egocentric identity. The scale of the climate change we are facing is too immense and overwhelming for an individual personality ego to absorb. Right? So David and Larry were speaking to this, the immensity. It just takes a lot of courage and work. And it's not only growing in our own sort of egoic maturity, but it's also being part of a collective. And I would also say it's about transcendence or incendence, if you will, so that we experience ourselves as a whole, a spiritual whole, meeting this situation. And how do we do that? I propose, uh, along with Jung and Plotkin and a <laughs> hundred others, that there is a kind of dissolution of self. And certainly we see it in culture before a rebirth. It's all sort of giving way to, um, you know, version 1.0 of you, composting it and letting 2.0 emerge. Um, the good news, is that at, uh, climate change, there's not much I like about it, I'll be honest, but it does seem to be catalyzing the evolution of human consciousness. The cause of climate change, in part, is actually a developmental crisis. It's a failure to move beyond ego and separation. Um, you know, a colleague of mine has done this test, he's asked, audiences everywhere. Dwayne Elgin is his name. Uh, are we in the infancy, the, the, the adolescence, the adulthood or elderhood of our species? And most people say either infancy or, or adolescence. What would it be to move beyond that, to develop from where we are and allow climate change to do that composting, which it's doing, and bring something <laughs> new forward? It's much easier to transition from our current human-centric to a responsive ecocentric mode of being when we open to the spiritual aliveness of soul. And I'll speak to what I mean by soul in a moment. Through the journey to soul, we can soften the fixation on e egoic identity to embrace, amongst other things, our ecological niche, the unique place through which our soul serves the ecosystem at this time. So, I'm presuming two things about you. Uh, one, um, that uh, you care <laughs> about climate change. Um, 
two, uh, that you have some kind of spiritual proclivity. If you don't, that's fine, but perhaps <laughs> uh, a, a presentation on soul and spirit won't be of too much interest to you. But I'm presuming that for, for a moment. So as I said, I'm calling this uh, climate change and purpose discovery. So here we go. The four topics I'll briefly present are that there's three worlds of purpose to wake up to what is sometimes referred to as traditional or classical enlightenment, to grow up to what I sometimes refer to as emotional adulthood, and to show up with our soul level purpose as a gift of service, as a demonstration of love to life. The second topic is soul, which will look through the lens of perception, imagination, and place to see what this word means. The third is the refusal of the call when we say, uh, no, thank you. And the fourth is the purpose octagon, eight facets of purpose. Whoops. <laughs> so in a nutshell, I am proposing an understanding of our existence based on the experience of three worlds of consciousness. Spirit, classical enlightenment, nirvana, God, upper world, ego, which you know what that is, and soul, which I'll get to in a moment. This cosmology holds to experience wholeness of the self and the world from which we are inseparable. We mustn't forget to engage soul and its primary power, the imaginal realm. Without the imaginal realm of soul, we have a bifurcated universe, a simple but dangerous split between spirit and matter. And when you know it, my slides won't move. <laughs> All right. Aha. Uh, this is a, this, whoop, back one. Um, so the split between spirit and matter I think can be seen in this picture of what looks like a giant circular saw on the end of a most gigantic crane. This is a quote from Thomas Berry from Dream of the Earth. He said, the most difficult transition is from the anthropocentric to the biocentric. Progress of the human at the expense of the larger life community ultimately leads to a diminishment of human life itself and all life. This slide comes from um, the deep water horizon uh, spill, the largest oil spill in human history. So the question is, can we continue to live, let alone flourish in our current condition? There's a lot to be said about our condition. Can we continue to live in our current, what I'm gonna call uninsold condition? Which begs the question, what do we mean by the word soul? And I like the word soul because it eludes a definition. That is its utility, right? So I don't have, I can't tell you what soul is. I can point to some of the perfumes that I've received from my teachers. So the first is soul as perception, as a, uh, an organ of perception. Soul is not an object um, or an entity, but a unique way of perceiving based on imagination, images, stories, sensations, and symbols. We know we have these five senses, I can smell, I can see, but imagine that there is only a partly used sense that is the imaginal, and it can be fully opened and the world looks quite different. So soul is imagination itself. Carl Jung employed the word Seelenbild uh, it's a term that means soul image. I love this, that he, he made a new word. Um, uh, one's soul image is a way that we can understand our destiny. Uh, Jung called it our unique myth. By receiving a soul image, we can come to understand our soul's destiny. And the third piece I want to share is soul as place. That soul is actually rooted in the world twice over. Once in the place where you are called to, 
your place that is currently home, but also in the wider Earth community. What is the function? What is the, um, what shall we say? What is the gift that is yours to make to the world? This quote that I use ad nauseum is from Frederick Buechner, and uh, Naharika said it in the intro, find the place where your deep gladness, your joy, and the world's hunger, its ache, meet. That's what I mean by soul place. So um, in a few minutes, I'm going to ask uh, Joanna to come on. I'm going to read a few quotes. I'm going to say a few things before that, though. This is a picture of the wheel and the bridge um, that I will speak to. But I'm going to share with you briefly um, a soul um, disclosure of my own, just to give you a, an example. And I'll do, give you the, the 40 second version. When I was 20 years old, I was doing an upper world retreat, that is to say a Zen retreat in a hundreds of year old cabin, log cabin in Northern Ontario, Canada, uh, alone. And uh, between periods of Zazen, I was lying on the couch just contemplating my future as young people will do. And then I had what I uh, later named, you know, a vision and, and a voice that I heard. And the voice said, whole person midwifery. It was an activity. I'd never heard those words before. And then I saw this image of, um, oh, the screen just did some weird thing. Well, we'll stop it and put it back up. Okay. And so this, these words came, whole person midwifery. And there was a, um, a, a vision of a table, me as a midwife, and then a person on the table. But they weren't I wasn't midwifing, you know, as a traditional midwife, it was their wholeness. And it was a, a full on total gestalt. And I realized that's it. It's been decided. <laughs> I've been, I've been shown my future. Um, and it, I knew it would take decades to train to, to be the thing that I was being shown um, by the vision. So that's an example just one example, and doesn't have to happen that way, of a soul disclosure. Um, so let's see if the, uh, is this, my computer's going a little crazy. Am I still sharing? No. Okay, so I'll put the um, thing back up. <clears throat> Great. So if this is true, um, if people like Joanna and others feel as if they have been called to some great work or some way of being in the world by something you know mysterious that I would call soul. Why is it that so few people would seem to be very aflame with their soul's purpose? Um, one, uh, we don't live in a soul uh, literate culture. Um, personally, my school, you know, from Toronto, Canada, I didn't get any education from uh, my religion, my parents, or my schools about about this. Um, competing commitments. Um, we have other commitments than just living our soul's purpose. Uh, Joanna has worked on and become a very courageous person, but I'm not quite so courageous. So there are parts of me that are like, yeah, I want to go out into the desert in October. I'm going to do this vision quest with one of my teachers. And I'm like, yes, it sounds great. And another part of me is like, oh God, it's called Death Valley, the place I'm going. I don't, I don't think I want to go there. So we have this desire for safety and frankly comfort on the one hand, and then the desire to stretch and grow on the other. So that's what I mean by competing, competing commitments. And the last is default purpose, that we might not even know that there is a place inside of us where soul level purpose can reside, because instead of living from that, we have reverted to a default or inherited purpose. It's not enough to be alive. You have to live. Being is a verb. It's an activity. The most profound and deepest act of being we can engage in is imagining. It changes us from objects in a world of things to subjects in a world of persons. Imagination is not in us. We are in imagination. This is Tom Cheatham. He's uh, um, a scholar, amongst other things, and teacher of Henri Corbin and, and one of our guest teachers at PGI. 
Uh, these are some of the signs of, um, of the refusal to call. Um, the experience of any of these doesn't necessarily mean, uh, uh, indicates soul loss, but um, you might want to check if you're experiencing these often, um, if there isn't some part of the situation that is a result of living from a default or inherited purpose. So my question is, if we're not living our unique purpose, then what agenda actually ends up directing your life? What is shaping our future? I had a little fun here, purpose 1.0 to 3.0. So this default purpose is something that we generally inherit, right? Become rich and happy and uh, beautiful and famous. Okay, fine, all right. It's automatic and it's uh, something that was authored for us. A level up from that is that we decide for ourselves, we create for ourselves. This is self-determined, self-constructed, and self-authored. In this scenario, Purpose 2.0, there are a variety of choices and we choose one through the creative intellect. But I wanna suggest a third option, which is Purpose 3.0 here, which is that we receive our marching orders. There is a disclosure, an encounter, a revelation or vision that comes from the mystery itself and it's soul determined. And so I didn't sit there and think, well, what should I be when I grow up? Oh yes, a whole person midwife. Mm, no, I don't, don't think, I don't know if one can do it like that. Um, and then uh, Joanna's will we'll speak to you in just a moment. Uh, one of my favorite teachers in the um, in this realm of soul purpose discovery is Bill Plotkin. The case to be made for soul initiation. The root cause of the dire crisis and challenges of our time is a wide failure in individual human development. How so, you may ask? Well, he says the descent to soul, by that he means the burrowing down inside of yourself to the level of something spiritual but unique to you is an extended process of initiation that takes place in a stage of human development most contemporary people never reach. A soul initiated person is someone who knows why they were born, knows who they are, as a unique individual participant in the web of life and who creatively occupies their distinctive eco niche. And again, my slides won't go forward, but up. Oh, okay. Uh, you can dwell on this so slide uh, if you're, you want to stop and, and watch this on YouTube. I just wanted to mention that this is a synthesis. The things that I'm saying, I didn't create myself. There are a great many teachers uh, and traditions that have informed me and taught me, and um, I just put nine of them in this uh, slide for you. Okay, last part. <clears throat> um, I want to share this idea that your soul level purpose isn't a monolithic single thing. So as Carl Jung put it, right, Seelenbild, there's a soul image at the center of your being which can help you understand your destiny. Uh, Bill Plotkin calls it your mythopoetic identity. Now out of that, how does that live in the world is another question. And I could have made four facets or eight facets or ten facets, it's, it's somewhat arbitrary. The one facet I want to pull out is the delivery vehicle number eight. There is a difference between your soul image, in my case, whole person midwifery, but it does not say that on my business card. It would be weird, <laughs> to say the least, to put that out there. But on my business card, it says things like psychotherapist, meditation teacher, purpose guide. Those are vehicles through which the gift of being a, uh, a steward of the soul core power of whole person midwifery can come forth. So this underworld journey to your soul purpose isn't the same as finding out the specific career. That happens along the way, but I don't like uh, to conflate those two. 
All right, so we're going to move to Joanna here. I love this quote. The great unraveling is undeniably happening and life will never be the same. But do not forget that the great turning is also alive and well. So um, I'm going to read this uh, piece from Joanna's Widening Circles and then uh, stop the share and then um, dialogue with um, Joanna. So this is 1957, I believe. Uh, in Munich, Germany, uh, in the basement of a university, and um, Joanna has uh, just given birth to her son, Jack, and she's been administered a hefty dose of um, ether, uh, and this is what happened. I am lifted up high over the world, which is so far below that I can't, oh, this computer, that I cannot see it. Yet I am also at the heart of the world, and a giant wheel is turning, and the manner of its turning is the secret of all things. I am on it, spread eagled across its spokes, my head near its open center. Sometimes it seems I could be the wheel. I'm so inseparable from it. I feel the spokes shudder through my body with alternating and intensifying sensations. So if we can get Joanna on the screen, my question to you, Joanna, is what was it like and how has it informed your life to have received this, I would call it mystical disclosure of the wheel, um, if you'd share a little. Well, I need to say right away that um, I was uh, on ether. So ether. it was my, uh, and, and it came at the, um, it was the University Frauen Clinic or Women's Hospital in the basement where uh, I was uh, giving birth to my second son. And um, the doctor hadn't shown up in time to give me even an aspirin. And so when he did come, he, uh, and I was in, I ripped, so I'd been torn open a little bit. So uh, he gave me plenty of ether. And I found myself then on this uh, <clears throat> incredible wheel where I was, as the wheel turned, it, it came through me, the spokes, and it came in terms of sensations of body and mind and with tremendous authority to give me a sense of there are moments when living here is in balance between uh, say heat and cold. And I moved through from into hotter and hotter temperature. I thought I'd die and then, oh, and then it just turns to uh, coolness. Or from uh, order or chaos and many things happening, ja, da, 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 and then that sinks into, moves through me into harmony or peace. Uh, it was all the um, intensity, sensations of life to their most extreme, and then ooh, moving through it. And there was the moments of balance uh, from between uh, heat and cold, or between agitation and quiet or between um, uh, reason and passion. All of these opposites could move through you. And the moment where it was tolerable and productive was always a moment of balance and it seemed to be that's the way 
everything comes to pass and that what you can tolerate is a uh, is an achievement of of balance and steadiness so that the <clears throat> i felt that this i was given to experience in my body on this the wheel turned through me uh, what was true for every experience or life form uh, and that um, the balance, the moments that passed through were what made life itself tolerable so that the uh, extraordinary achievement and taste of uh, that balance was where uh, life could be achieved somehow. Everything after that uh, seemed could be understood that way for me and uh, and it became understandable and ex and and ex very precious and it influenced uh, that I uh, I wanted that kind of understanding and went back into uh, graduate work uh, a few years later, well, uh, 10 years later, to, and found myself uh, studying not only uh, the Buddha Dharma, the, the uh, incredible uh, complementarity uh, that's there uh, in nonlinear thinking of how, uh, and but then I I did my doctorate in uh, living systems theory, so that it was, and that the place where you can think and be create is is always a moment of of fragile balance. It's uh, I, I have so many sort of clarifying questions I want to ask about this amazing experience of a, a vision really on on the birthing bed. But I want to just share the second slide, the second vignette of yours, if I may. So now imagine it's 1966, 56 years ago, Dalhousie, India, and Joanna is um, meditating uh, with Tibetan Buddhists. And this is uh, a, a, something that uh, sprung up, a, a wellspring, a vision, a disclosure um, uh, that happened. So in my inner eye appeared a bridge. This is from her memoir, Widening Circles. In my inner eye appeared a bridge, slightly arching, made of stone. I could see the separate rocks of which it was built, and I wanted to be one of them. Just one. That was enough. If only I could be part of that bridge between the thought worlds of East and West, connecting the insights of the Buddha Dharma with the modern Western mind. What might my role be at the podium of a classroom, a desk at a library tower, was less clear to me than the conviction possessing me now. I would be a stone in the building of that bridge. hundred questions, but what was it like to receive this image? I would say from soul, but whatever word cursed to you, that pointed to your destiny that you've lived out. What was it like to receive it and then begin to live into it? It, it came as a with a sense of uh, calling and also certainty of, ah, that's it. I want that. That sense also it had something of an appetite. I want to be that. I love that. So it, 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 
Appetite is such an interesting word. So there's the regular human appetites. I want pleasure and comfort and safety and so forth. Would you say this is a transcendent or incendent appetite, an appetite from your depths that came online more forcefully uh, at, in that Tibetan meditation mm -hmm. um, retreat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I loved it. And also love. I just loved that a bridge is very simple and I could see each separate stone in it. And it was all I wanted. I just wanted to be a bridge. <laughs> simple. And well, there are bridges going back through time and into the future. Well, this is a unique opportunity because um, uh, this was this happened 56 years ago this particular disclosure now it's 2022 you're 93 um I, I have my opinion about the answer did you live as a bridge were you able to embody the vision the disclosure that was given to you here's an example oh for heaven's sakes yes <laughs> <laughs> dumb question jonathan for example uh and see, I got very involved in uh, the problem of nuclear waste, that we as a culture were putting it anywhere. We didn't worry about how the disposition of this most contaminating stuff for would affect all the people coming after us and all the beings. And as if we didn't give a shit for what was the future beings coming after us. Just give it to the mafia to get rid of or dump it in the ocean. And so uh, I began to work a lot around nuclear waste. And that carried me into a whole part of my uh, work that reconnects in the um, practical, imaginable, imaginative practices was with the future beings. I was a bridge to the future beings because I wanted them to be able to understand they must take care of the poison fire. And even the word, the poison fire, came from the when we, we started practicing being future beings. Mm. Going back to something you said, that um, there was a sense of certainty. So there's the, the pathway to a soul disclosure. And in this case, uh, you know, meditate, meditation. Uh, was was part of the milieu of where this happened. But then there's the question of how does one recognize the vision is authentic? And for you, it was, I am this. Uh, there's a certainty, there's a there's a sacred appetite. Um, so I think that that certainty piece is so interesting because so many, so often the human mind goes, well, uh, hedges it spets. You knew I want to be a single stone in yeah. that bridge. And love response. I love that. I want this. Mm. It's mm. desire. I want this. I want to be that. Mm. Mm. You are. You were that. You are that. And then it was a question of what integrating it or embodying it. Yeah. But uh, it just happened naturally. Mm. 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 It's just like being a bridge is what I do, and so I don't even think the world bridge, the word yeah. bridge or something. Yeah, you are a bridge. And so bridges do what bridges do naturally. Yeah. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, that is uh, as, as good a um, description of what I've been trying to point to of uh, being one's unique myth or one's mythopoetic identity or one's soul image. You're a bridge. What else? Are you, what else are bridges gonna do? And I like to, and I find it so good. We have in the work that reconnects all sorts of pr interactive practices, which give people a delight in being a bridge, where you have a conversation and you converse as a future being with a moment person of today, or you use your imagination. I think that and role playing mm. your imagination ignited by role playing mm. Mm. great 
Well, in a moment, I want to ask um, for some folks from um, the group who are gathered here to offer any questions to you or me if they want. Um, so Naharika, you can raise your digital hand um, on Zoom and we'll have time for a couple of pieces. But I will ask for this though, which is that we uh, stick to those vignettes. This, there's a thousand topics Joanna can speak, you know, with their edition on, but let us focus on um, uh, purpose discovery from that incredible um, passages that happened, uh, that were shared in, in widening circles. Um, Joanna, anything you wanna say before we take a few, few questions and comments? about no, this I, idea of well, I love talking about this I didn't yeah. mean, <laughs> because it's it's just touches such gratitude in my life mm. Mm. does it feel essential there's so much I think a question that comes up is there's so there's so many oh great we have someone uh, there's so many uh disasters really just so much pain does it behoove us to take time to engage in this what I call underworld journey to soul and, and experience one of these images, or should we just throw ourselves into the work? How much utility would you do you think it's worthwhile giving attention to to purpose discovery or image support? These images come out of caring. Hmm. And I found myself having my capacity to care. Uh, for the world or for people or for a tree or for a little critter or uh, is uh, the medium um, uh, to allow yourself to and I and then the use of the imagination uh, stimulates caring and caring you know this it's it uh, they help each other you know it makes you feel more alive sensing the connection and keeping your senses alive mm, mm, beautifully put thank you all right well let's go to mark you can unmute yourself and uh share hello uh <clears throat> joanna i i listened to your shambhala warrior thing uh almost every week because it's uh, mixed on edm type music on soundcloud and all this stuff and um, it gives me a lot of purpose, I think, uh, thinking about that and the uh, mano y mano. We created this so we can uncreate this. So my, que my question. You so he's, I just want to tell people he's talking about a prophecy. That prophecy that's 12 centuries old. About the coming of the kingdom of Shabala. Yeah. So. I think my question is, uh, are you where where are you seeing um, examples of this, and um, and and how are you feeling about that at this point in time, that prophecy? Uh, well, I I think that um, I don't have time to go into it now, but I what I'm aware of is how many people are showing up now uh, and often uh, kids and young people too uh, and then people more like my age too that there is uh, a deep or love capacity to love our earth see what's Science is showing us our, our earth is a living system. And then uh, I'm affected by, along with that systems thinking that deep ecology helps you live and own these uh, larger realms of who you are and be able to uh, be so grateful for that that you can feel them uh, working through you. So the preposition for this moment of human life is seems to be through. You can be, things can work through you. 
the living earth, if you take a sense of identity, identified with it, uh, can uh, work through you so that you don't see it. It's not my power. It's not my smarts. It's not um, my cleverness or my devotion. Uh, it's because it comes uh, from the living earth. I become an a you become an agent of something much vaster if you trust. So this is so incredible. And I this came to me in my uh, mid-40s, I guess, uh, when I encountered a deep ecologist, rain, rainforest activist uh, in Australia named John Seed. He's still alive, but he went... And, it, and, and it, then the rest of us caught it from him because he was defending the rainforest from illegal logging. And he was able to stand there and facing the police and the illegal loggers, knowing he said some reason it changed his sense of who he was. He was the rainforest defending itself. Now, once you have that shift in identity, that you are being, uh, uh, that this larger identity acts through you because the earth needs human hands. The earth needs human voices. And we're in a time when as humans, I can talk to other humans. We're the ones who are acting like idiots. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Mark. We're gonna go to Daniel. Uh, next. And then um, I'm going to invite uh, Larry and David back to just interact with uh, Joanna and I for a few minutes, uh, a few closing announcements. And then if Joanna, if you want to stay, I'm going to have a little after party for anyone who wants to stay and keep doing dialogue. It would be wonderful because we have a whole queue of hands. So totally up to you. But let's go to Daniel now. Yeah, very uh, grateful to be here. I have uh, two fast questions. The first, uh, the six maxims. If uh, you want to teach in a workshop of the the world that reconnects, uh, where you could put it in the in the in the four phases? Maybe in the fourth one, in the going forward, to to share it to the people in the workshop. Oh, well, that's yeah, because the work goes through uh, gratitude. At the first, you're talking about the spiral of the workshop? Mm, yeah. yeah. So that's the, yeah, those are wonderful questions. So you think which of the maxims um, or maybe place your yeah. gratitude or, and then the um, uh, feeling pain for the world. So uh, open to anguish for uh, our planet and its, all its beings. So work hard to see them. That first maxim would be very good for that, wouldn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. So maybe to separate the, the maxims into different uh, yeah. places yeah. of the or spiral would be also good. Yeah. yeah. You could shuffle them around. You could also make some maxims of your of your own. Yeah. And another. Uh, first I haven't tried to about, do that yet. Yeah. About about the myth of uh, Pandora. The elfis, the, the the hope in the Greek tradition. Uh, I don't know if you could share something about that myth and how we could bring it to the to the active hope. No, the myth of yeah, uh, yeah. But I think that um, the main thing is that hope is is uh, very much in your intention, what you want to ha have what you would like to have happen and that that and you can encourage that so you act on uh that's what uh chris my co-author and i think of active hope is what we want to see happen it's our intention and then so my, maybe different from the greek uh, myth it's different. Oh. It's different from the Greek from, from the Greek myth of Pandora. Well, you can use it. You can use that. 
because the, in the Greek myth, when you open up all those miseries and all the uh, discouragements that uh, come, uh, but the, there is also, you look and there's always that little, like it's like a fairy. So you never, I th my understanding of the Greek myth is that when you're presented with uh, a lot of awful possibilities, oh my God, there's, there's always something, there's always that little, looks like a little fairy, you know, and it's there. Yeah, I think it's the three card of the tarot, the, the star card of the tarot also. So we can uh, take that uh, strength also from the archetypes of, of the uh, Elphis, uh, that uh, Greek uh, goddess, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. <laughs> to have more uh, imaginal uh, work. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Daniel. You. Well, I'd love to invite uh, Larry and uh, David uh, to come. So if we can spotlight them, if they're still here. Uh, just Larry, maybe. So yeah, any um, any thoughts or disagreement? Oh, good. And David's here too. Any, any uh, thoughts? Just hearing a little bit of your insights weighing in on this notion of, you know, destiny or disclosures, um, as uh, Joanna spoke about it and... Um, in widening circles, as I shared a little bit of my cosmology in the presentation. Okay, Larry, your turn. <laughs> you know, I was just thinking that um, one of the key ingredients is being open and uh, being receptive uh, from unexpected people, unexpected places. Um, and uh, just letting yourself dwell in a, a sense of being rooted, not living on the earth, but rooted in the earth, like everything that we can see and perceive. And um, that to me is a, is a wonderful way of trying to open up. There's nothing greater for me than walking in a forest uh, and listening and being with all the other living things. Uh, So when I think about uh, climate change as spiritual practice, as the way that we've been working on this all along, um, one of the ideas that I have is that the meeting of suffering and compassion is like the uh, supernova of uh, human experience. It's the meeting point of uh, two great fields of power that are in some ways one field. They are uh, two sides of the immense interconnection that's there. And part of the reason I like this image is uh, the supernova is a place where anything can happen and new things can happen. Uh, I don't understand the physics of this, so probably some of you out there are laughing at me. But anyway, there are uh, stars that are created. There's star dust that's created. There is new stuff. And so this, to me, is part of the place of radical hope. It's the place where uh, suffering meets our intention to be kind, our intention to be compassionate. And at that point, there is an explosion of uh, possibility that we couldn't imagine. And so uh, climate change as a spiritual opportunity is a place where we know that there is going to be suffering and we can, uh, as Shambhala warriors, or at least incipient uh, warriors, we can bring to it intention, attention, and uh, love. Uh, and in bringing those together, then new things can happen beyond uh, anything that we could have imagined. Thank you. I, the word that comes to me when I think of like the supernova that created our solar system even, I, wow, is that uh, it's like 
our universe is built on generosity, that there is uh, even uh, something shattering to pieces uh, is uh, an act of such uh, open, inventive generosity because you mix things up. And uh, that that's, and it's also uh, a universe of reciprocity uh, that uh, where uh, there's out of the very suffering uh, and out of the pain and, and out of the loss, uh, if you're brave enough to just say, ooh, ouch, <laughs> you can be with it and with, where so much can be uh, brought to come to be. I think that as we um, we as we face the uncertainty of uh, our whole situation now, and with a uh, walking toward it and not uh, closing our eyes and stuffing our ears and I, I, I can't stand it, I can't stand it, but to open to what is meeting me, what what can come of this, what uh, so as there's a, a gesture, an open arm gesture, because uh, we don't want to act as if, um, you know, there's a, we were never promised a rose garden. You know, it was just being alive. Hey, guys, just being alive to taste something, to feel the skin of another being, to uh, water, you know, just... And, and and stop acting as if we uh, there's some promise to be made that everything is going to be just what we want. That's so boring. It's just see, see what's there and allow yourself to be surprised and allow yourself to treasure uh, this adventure. And I know, all I know is I didn't want I'm so glad to be in my 90s. It's just been out of this world, so much happiness because I wanted, I didn't want people to, I didn't want to miss out on. I just didn't want to miss out on what we're facing. It's going to bring something so exquisite for us, or at least the chance of it. We're going to feel things and see things about being alive. And having touch and having sight and having taste, all of that will be more and more wondrous as we stop thinking that everything is owed to us. Mm -hmm. And then discovering always new ways of things to taste and things to love. Or just the different tonalities of patience itself. <laughs> we are just going to be staggered, just staggered by the way we experience things that oh, we thought we had it figured out, didn't we? We thought we, thought we knew. Oh, and we're going to be discovering new ways of singing, of loving, of caring. It's just at the, at the same time as we're scared shitless. It's only there. It's there. We, we are the earth. We are the earth uh, knowing and seeing and developing all these incredibly vulnerable senses that are so exquisite. And we just, it's just, uh, see if you, we can, I'm sure we can uh, correct, sort of cleanse ourselves from uh, 
complaining all the time. You know, uh, we're here. We're here in this on this beautiful planet that's kind of out of balance. And there's so much, and 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 I just love what uh, you are doing, David and Larry. If you're looking at it without complaining, you're looking at it to see what we can learn, what we can experience, how we can use our minds and our sensations as an adventure. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. It was a transmission of love and courage and wisdom. Um, I have a few closing announcements, but it, can the three of you stay another 10 or 20 minutes? If not, that's totally okay. <laughs> totally okay, but just, just asking. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Joanna, see if I have something more important than talking about <laughs> the end of the world with oh, come on. 900 people. Well, we have we have a whole queue of people, and I'd love to invite them into the conversation with the three, the, the four of us. Um, uh, so let me just get these announcements uh, done, and then we can yeah. stop yeah. the recording. Um, okay, number one, thank you, Larry, David, Joanna for your time, your love, your erudition, your intelligence, um, your passion. I've learned so much from the three of you. Number two, there'll be a follow-up email um, and it will have a couple of things. Um, one, it'll have the recording. <laughs> two, um, our friends at Job One for Humanity are offering uh, free five eBooks on climate change and a free one-year membership to their uh, platform. Uh, so please take a look at that. Um, uh, a, another goodie we'll be offering, there'll be a, um, I just did that little 12, 13 minute presentation on, on purpose discovery. There's a 75 minute presentation, a webinar I did May 31st, and you can watch that um, if you are interested. Um, in a subsequent email, um, that Shambhala warrior prophecy, um, Joanna came as a guest teacher to PGI virtually in Zoom. We recorded it. It was, and she has a few versions of it out there, but I think the one she did with us was amongst the very best. It really is a transmission, Joanna at her best. So we'll be sending you the recording of the Shambhala warrior prophecy that uh, Joanna, it's just 10 minutes. So, I mean, really suggest you. You, um... It's 12 centuries old. Yeah. Yeah, from the uh, the time when... And here you are in Berkeley. The Dharma came to Tibet. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's magnificent. And so it'll be in your inbox. Please look for it. Um, next thing is to continue the discussion and the community. Um, if you want to come to our private Facebook page and you'll see me saying something about this event and please share um, your despair, your hope, your your visions, um, the, your troubles. Um, it's all welcome and calls to action. What, what, what you want to do with others in this community um, together. Also put a, another copy of the of the um, of the Maxims uh, paper. Uh, for you there as well. And it'll also be in the in the link below here on YouTube. Um, next steps in the next email, and I'll just underline this, uh, and invite you to work with others. And so I'm just going to mention two organizations. I'm not paid for this. They, they don't know me. Um, Extinction Rebellion has groups all over the planet. They each have different characters. Check it out. 
Go be with your people in your country, your state, your province, and work together. Um, uh, two, swing left. In the United States, um, there is, uh, well, one party that is more responsible, more responsive to climate change than the other. And so uh, Swing Left is an organization that I have put some energy into and sent them money, um, swing states, and making sure we get more of the kind of representatives we need. Um, so there's frontline activism, and then there's uh, getting the right people in and then pressuring them, because it's hard to keep your promise when you're a politician, apparently. Mm -hmm. And so this is, this is something tangible that we can do. Swing left and Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and there's many other opp opportunities. Um, the third and last piece is uh, what we do here at Purpose Guides Institute is the sort of spiritual end of the climate change activism, which is discovering and embodying your life's purpose. And then secondarily, for those who are interested, becoming a Purpose Guide themselves. Um, so the, the 30 second version of it is we start in September and we go to December and we meet 12 times in a large group and then uh, 12 times in a small group. So you can really have a lot of um, handholding as you go through this process. Um, it's taught by a quartet of people. I'm actually one of the guest teachers because I'm on partial sabbatical. Um, and we also have um, special visiting teachers, including Michael Mead, who is an amazing mythologist. He will be coming and visiting. Uh, the essayist and public intellectual Charles Eisenstein will also be making an appearance. Um, and then we'll have a video recording of one of Joanna's many visits to PGI available for those people. And then at a later time, the, the subsequent semester, if you will, of training to be a purpose guide will happen. Um, so I'll send out some more information there. Um, Haruka, am I forgetting anything um, important? <laughs> I probably am. No, we are good. Thank you. We're good. Okay. I'd like to add something. Yes, yeah. please. Um, these gatherings are offered as a gift free of charge. Ah. And so we ask if you um, feel the value of this offering and would like to contribute. I just put our donation link in the chat. Um, so please, please do um, contribute if you feel moved. Thank you. Thank you so much. I completely forgot about that. That's that's of great consequence to us. Um, it looks like just a Zoom meeting, but it, it costs thousands and thousands to pay our staff and put these things on. And we want to keep doing this with other people. We've done it with Charles Eisenstein, Terry Patton, um, uh, Joanna a few times, and we want to invite others. So if you can afford $20 or more, um, please um, you know, give as generously as you feel moved. If you cannot afford that much or nothing, please take it as a gift. Um, you know, many, many people can't afford it, but if you can, um, we'll put out a, an appeal um, asking for your support so we can keep producing these events. So thank you for that reminder, Catherine. Keep the lights on. All right. Well, um, thank you for your attention. We're going to go to an after party in just a moment, starting with, it looks like someone named Free from the UK. Um, so I'm going to stop the recording here. So we just have a a two hour piece. And um, thank you so much. And we'll uh, continue the dialogue hopefully on Facebook and beyond. Um, any last words from David, Larry, and Joanna? I say goodbye. Oh, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Thank you, each one of you, and all the ones who didn't speak but held us with your attention. So appreciated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're all facing it. We're all on this beautiful planet. Wow, what a time we're going to have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Well, after party is starting in uh, five seconds. I'm just going to stop the recording here. Or maybe actually one of you can stop the recording. And I'd like to take Free and then Shakti and then Mark um, to join the conversation. And again, and again, please, if you can, keep the conversations to the maxims, to purpose, discovery, climate change. I know it's easy to go, you know, all over the place. So let's go with, is this, I can't see the name. Is this free? It is. Okay.
Welcome. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and firstly, a deep gratitude for the work that's gone before and the work that's coming. So I learned the work that reconnects from Extinction Rebellion through Extinction Rebellion. Oh. And I've been delivering. So thank you so much, Joanna Macy, for that gift of that work and being able to share it with others. And also, I'm really excited about the six maxims um, and what that work's going to produce. Um, I'm curious about the word hope. Um, personally, I'd like to, to ask you to speak on that because I feel a lot more like Joanna spoke about being here and being present and Buddhism speaks a lot about being present and living the moment to the full and the future is not owed to us. So I just want like to invite that question about why the word hope rather than like intention, as Joanna mentioned, hope is kind of our intention for the future or active being like being present and living fully so that's the question I've got why the word hope rather than intention or or something else that is more present based rather than future based oh okay well uh because hope is um and we could have said yeah intention um but or what gives us hope is that we have intention and can act on it. And so it's hope that needs, uh, has more resonance for people and needs to be claimed. Uh, we want to have hope. And so to realize, yes, we want to have hope. We deserve to have hope. And how do we have it? So that it, it's, I uh, Chris, uh, my co-author and I uh, want to transform and and vitalize the word hope. I would um, I would add to that that are we there? Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I didn't see the green box, so I couldn't. You know, um, I think <laughs> hope is present time. Huh? It's it's a stance uh, right now. I, it's not. Um, I don't think of it as primarily in the future. That's part of what's radical about it. It's not uh, something that you have expectations that are then going to fail. Um, and another translation for it. I mean, what you've offered it as intention is a uh, is a good translation of it. But another one to me is uh, not to abandon. Um, hope, hope is about not abandoning other people, but also not about, uh, it's about not abandoning the situation in which you're in, uh, sorry, double preposition, mayhem, where you are. <laughs> um, it's about not abandoning that. And that is itself hope. By, by not giving up, by not abandoning, you are you are living in hope, so it's a present time. Does, mm. does that make sense? Does that it doesn't answer your question? I th no, I think I think <laughs> I think it does. It's just it's it's something that I'm having to work with because I'm yeah. trying to live very right. presently in my meditation. So I think that's it's this and that maybe is a way of of saying it. And I did did wonder. If, if you're developing workshops or considering what developing workshops around the six maxims, maybe combining with the work that reconnects. Um, we've had some, I mean, Joanna, we've exchanged some emails about that. So it's a possibility. I'm not sure I understood. Thank you, Free. Bring the thank you, thank you. Yeah, Let's absolutely. go to Shakti and then uh, to Mark. If you want to work together Hi, this is um, I I attended the last um, talk that you did, Joanna, and it was really really amazing. And I so appreciate how you just you you know you went right for the heart, <laughs> and it was pretty intense. And I was pretty shaken up for a while after that, but you know that's. I'm a Buddhist practitioner too. And I, so I understand like you, it's not hide, don't hide under a rock and pretend it's not happening. And that 
it was really important to me here. I also went to the um, introductory um, purpose um, workshop that, that you did, Jonathan, and um, and also within all of this, I've been applying for the eco chaplaincy Buddhist eco chaplaincy um, training, and um, so I was just accepted in that. And I've been like wrapping my head around being an um, eco chaplain, and um, also having lived twenty five years with a progressive disability. That um, you know, I'm always managing. It's like constant and. Um, sort of going, can I handle this? Is this like, is this right? And then listening to this and really knowing that like it, you know, being, I love the being the brick in the, in the bridge, you know, I will put into, because this eco chaplaincy program really rings with all of what you guys were talking about today, you know, with this idea of our world is it's, it's a spiritual journey and we need people who can help just out with the general population of dealing with what is pretty devastating condition you know and so i'm i'm you know getting starting that journey and it's feeling really right hearing this but also interestingly like last night talking to friends that i've known for 30 years um we had a little gathering and i started bringing up a little bit because I was still resonating from the, you know, it's, this is intense. Our, our world is disintegrating around us, starting to put out some of that. And I was like immediately picked up that like, no, it's not that bad. You're, and I'm like, oh my God, I feel like the bummer trip of my friends. Like they're not going to want to hang out with me. Uh. I'm coming in the room with the, with the heavy like information and i'm like oh my god whoa so, so shocked yeah i think that's such an, a, a a poignant experience and i want to ask these three to maybe respond to it yeah. like so we're hanging out with our friends and people say well how are you doing and the truth is you just read some really you know news that has has taken you to despair do you lose you have you three been losing friends as a result of talking about this and if not how, how are you managing that balance between being authentic with your grief when it's there and also harmonizing with the situation i think that's a great question i i, I think um we have to empathize with people who are having a tough time really coming to grips with this and be patient with them and stay open to a conversation we can have with them. So if we can't talk about the worst scenario, uh, we might be able to talk about some other things that everybody recognizes. <clears throat> you know, wildfires, floods, uh, the heating of the atmosphere, and about also, um, you know, the greenwashing that's going on and the kind of ways in which Politically, we have been so inept at dealing with this and ask them how they feel about, about that, that, uh, you know, probe a bit into their own sensibility if we can um, and stay with them because those people will likely come back. Something yeah. that I do is um, I tell the story of writing this article. And so I say, you know, I've been following this stuff for a long time. Uh, I read The Limits to Growth. Some of us will remember this, right? 1968. And um, so I've been following this stuff for a long time. But in the process of writing this article, Larry and I spent two months reading almost nothing else. And then we wrote the article. And then what I say to people is, it took me two months to come back to... Um, back to the surface. And so it was a way of talking without challenging them, but a way of saying, this is a kind of experience that you go through when you immerse yourself in this. Uh, and sometimes that becomes an entryway to a, a conversation. That makes sense? Yes, yes. I, I think um, that's the subtlety kind of, at, you know, it's the Communication part, I think that, you know, my Buddhist practice actually helps with too, because we talk a lot about <laughs> communicating nonviolently. <laughs> and even though it's not like 
I'm, I'm trying to be violent with it, but it, sometimes the truth feels like a vi yeah. violation to people. And so, yeah, to mm -hmm. how to, how to present it more of kind of in a balanced way, how to open someone's heart who may be like, you know, yeah. I'm not right. ready to go there yet. Right. Thank yeah. you so much, Shakti. You Thank brought you. up something so important. We'll see who pops up on the screen next. And it is Mark. Welcome, Mark. Greetings. Greetings. Hello, Joanna. Hi. Um, <laughs> my question is, goes back to something that you said, Jonathan, about delivery system in your purpose talk there. And um, Joanna has had the most amazing delivery system in the work that reconnects. And um, there are times in my own journey here where in the immensity of what we're facing, in the immensity of the bad news, I, um, I can, my despair can be like, oh, I've got this little thing I'm holding out in my hand. And on a bad day, it feels irrelevant. Like, is that really of service? Is that really of purpose? And yet I also know it's what I was designed to do, right? But Joanna's image of being a stone in that bridge is a real powerful one. I think at times I feel more like a homeopathic remedy. Um, you know, this little vibrational pellet that's trying to come into in an immensely messed up situation, you know? And so that, can, in my own journey of purpose, that feels like my own razor's edge with despair, right? And that place in my life where when I'm in despair, I feel cut off, right? Mm -hmm. And when I'm in grief, I feel connected because I'm connected to love. And there's a huge difference there for me, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. um, but that how to keep going with purpose sometimes, you know, in, in, you know, with the onslaught of the news or just the, you know, I, I, I hear the questions about hope and I, I struggle with that myself too in the use of the word. I appreciated Free's question, but, you know, yeah, to, to keep nurturing that sense of connection as you inch forward into such uncertainty um, as you, find the people you need and the conversations you need and the ceremonies you need. And yet, you know, even just recently in my life, I'm like, really, I'm going to hold out this in the midst of that. And um, any thoughts on that? Your words, <clears throat> the way you say them, they're touching people right now. Dozens, hundreds. They're beautiful. You're saying those words help people feel connected. We're going through a hard time. And to just say that so that if you're having a hard time, you're still connected in it. We're, it's your way of, you were hugging people as you... <laughs> said those words I, that was sort of the function that I experienced uh, people felt uh, acknowledged in their loneliness so to be to feel sad uh, is not is one of the ways our ancestors <laughs> could know that they belonged too, that there were, they would, uh, or even you, I will cry out, I will cry out to the Lord, you know, that this, uh, these songs that people sang over the generations and centuries. The, the songs of the broken heart or the wasted dreams 
They're very beautiful. And so they fertilize the heart. Tears are made of this, are salty like our oceans. Our grief shows how we belong. Think of all those that uh, want to come to your arms and taste your tears to know that they belong to this in a way, in a very deep way to our planet in this moment. We've had so much comedy. We've had so many marching bands. We've had so many shows to make you laugh. We've had canned laughter on the radio channels. But to feel the intimacy that with each other and with ourselves and with our world that comes through our, our grief and our tears and our poetry. Yeah. And feel held. We are holding in, in this very moment on this uh, Zoom call on this YouTube, we are holding each other. It's the most beautiful thing. So we thank each other. Then we feel thanks. I have people I can be real with. I have people I can bring my most long, greatest loneliness to. And then it doesn't then then it's something so sweet. There's so many people who want to cry. There are people in military barracks who would like to cry. Our tears can fill the oceans. <laughs> Yeah, so boy, how good, how sweet is the news of that, that sense of, of belonging that comes from that. You belong here. You let earth matter to you. You care. You really care, don't you? As I do, as our parched earth is dried out by our not caring, seeming to care. Thank you so much, Joanna. Thank you so much, Mark.